Hi everybody, I'm David Gully from Bentley University and this is the uh, fourth of five videos on central bank communication and this particular video is on the impact of communication on the economy. So we have a whole series of videos on communication. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, Bentley University EC391. Uh, so please take a look at the videos posted there. They're on a wide variety of monetary policy topics. So what we'll do here in this video is give a really quick review of communication. And then we'll move on to our main topic of looking at how communications from a central bank might affect the financial markets and the economy. And then we'll look at some empirical evidence of how communications affected financial markets and the economy as well. So quick review here. So in about the last 20 to 25 years, central banks have dramatically increased both the scale and the scope of communications. And they've done this most especially after the Great Recession, in other words, in the last 10 years. And the whole intent of communication is to further a central bank's policy objectives. In the case of the, the US Fed, it's to maintain an inflation rate of 2% and full and stable employment. That's the Fed's dual mandate. And central banks communicate a, a, a lot of things. They communicate their long-run goals, their policy tools, forecasts of the economy, forecasts of their monetary policy instruments, risks to the economy, and maybe the future path of policy instruments. Again, there's a whole range of things that a, a central bank can communicate. And so what we want to look at first here is to think about, well, how can a central bank and how it communicates impact the economy? So what a central bank says, it turns out, can affect public, and this is key here, public expectations about the future path of monetary policy, or it can cause them to adjust their view of the current or the expected state of the economy. Again, the key word here that's shown up a bunch of times in that first bullet point are expectations. Key point we want to emphasize here is that changes in the expectations of the public can impact the current economy. And if a central bank can manage those expectations, it can improve economic outcomes. So what we want to do is look at what are referred to as transmission mechanisms. In other words, what are the, the channels through which a change in communications can actually impact the financial markets and can impact the underlying economy. And I'd like to point out here, we have two complete videos on transmission mechanisms of monetary policies elsewhere on our YouTube channel. So let's first think about how this might work by using Ben Bernanke's very good March 2013 speech. So what he did is he noted that you can break long-term nominal interest rates down into three separate components. The first is an average of expected short-term real interest rates, what's referred to as a liquidity premium. And a liquidity premium is the extra return you have to offer holders of long-term debt to take the risk or to bear the risk of holding a longer-term asset versus a shorter-term asset. And then finally, the average expected inflation rate, or in other words, the inflation premium. And so what we can do is we can uh, see how those three components arise through looking at two basic financial economic concepts. First is the Fisher equation, and the second is the term structure of interest rates. So the Fisher equation breaks down a nominal interest rate into two components. It breaks down into the real rate and inflation expectations. In other words, the inflation premium that you have to offer holders of a debt instrument to protect themselves against inflation or the expected inflation over the life of the debt instrument. And then the term structure of interest rates breaks a longer term rate down into an average of a bunch of short term interest rates and this liquidity premium that I just mentioned. And so it turns out what you can do is if you combine these two concepts, you can combine or can break down a long term nominal interest rate into the average of a short term real rate, a liquidity premium, and inflation expectations. And I would note that uh, we do have a separate video on our YouTube channel that in detail discusses the term structure of interest rates. Now, this is where communication comes in handy. So if a central bank can credibly commit to keeping short term interest rates low, what that will do is that will keep the average real rate relatively low and that will help keep a longer term nominal interest rate relatively low. Following on with this, if a central bank can also credibly, keyword here credibly, commit to keeping inflation low, 
That reduces the inflation premium on a long-term nominal interest rate, and that works to reduce long-term nominal interest rates. And then finally, and this is an aside, but we need this for completeness, is by using quantitative easing, or in other words, large-scale asset purchases, the liquidity premium also fell. So those three things combined all work to reduce long-term nominal interest rates. And if long-term nominal interest rates decline, that'll work to increase consumption and work to increase investment, which are two important components of aggregate demand. So now let's think this through in some more detail. So let's suppose that, okay, a central bank is able to move long-term rates in the downward direction. Okay, well, what will that do to the economy? Well, let's think this through in some detail. So the first thing it might do, and this would be the most straightforward way to look at it, is lower longer-term interest rates will work to increase consumption, especially of, uh, you know, big ticket items, you know, automobiles and things like this. And also, from a point of view of firms, there'll be more positive net present value projects. So investment will tend to increase, and both those things, as I noted, will work to increase aggregate demand. Likewise, other things equal, lower longer-term nominal interest rates will work to, to depreciate a country's currency. And over time, if that's the case, what that might tend to do is that will tend to work to increase exports because exports become cheaper, and it'll work to reduce imports, and that's because imports become more expensive, so that tends to increase net exports, which will work to increase aggregate demand. It will also tend to work to increase the volume of bank lending. And this seems at least a little bit odd, at least at, at first, because why would a bank make more loans if longer-term interest rates are falling? That would seem counterintuitive. But here's the thing to keep in mind. When an economy gets better, there are more credit-worthy companies to which to make loans to. And so if there are more credit-worthy companies, banks will tend to increase lending volume even with lower longer-term interest rates. And so what happens here, as the economy gets better, is that revenue to firms will increase, which improves cash flow. And also, if long-term interest rates fall, since most firms are net borrowers, that will reduce the cash flow needed to fund debt payments, and that will improve their free cash flow, and in other words, make them better credit risk. So in other words, banks will tend to lend more in that situation. And then also, another thing that will tend to happen is that lower longer-term nominal interest rates will tend to work to increase both bond and stock prices. There are a large number of what are referred to as valuation models for both fixed income and equities, and these models all include, in various forms, longer-term nominal interest rates, and when those longer-term nominal interest rates decline, that will work to raise stock and bond prices. Well, if stock and bond prices rise along with an improving economy, this will tend to increase household wealth. Wealthier households, unsurprisingly, tend to increase their spending, which will work to increase aggregate demand. Also, as a little side note here, when housing prices and other assets appreciate, this improves collateral for loans. And as collateral for loans improves for both households and firms, that additional collateral provides for potential additional borrowing. Also, higher stock prices, interestingly, that will tend to induce more firms to sell more share of them, shares of themselves to the public. They then can use those proceeds to undertake investment projects, hire workers, and do all kinds of things. Those factors, of course, will work to improve the economy. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, what's referred to as the signaling channel. Central bank might signal through its commitment to keep its policy rate low for a long time, that it's on the job to get the economy back to full employment if it's in a weak position. And if the public at large believes that the central bank is on the job and is going to work hard to move the economy back to full employment, that might improve consumer and business confidence, and therefore that might work to increase aggregate demand. So now we look to is there actual evidence that communication matters? So we have sort of a theoretical background, but we need actual evidence. So before we turn to the official statistical evidence, what I want to do here is give the single best example of why a central bank communication can matter. And this is from the European Central Bank. So let's go back to 2012 and let's put ourselves in, in the Eurozone. Things are not going very well at all. Greece is a disaster, to put it mildly. 
and Spain and Italy are not far behind. The bottom line, without going into great detail, is that the Euro and the Eurozone were facing an existential crisis because, for example, there was a chance that Greece might leave the Euro and that might have induced Spain and Italy and maybe even other countries to leave. So again, there was an existential crisis here. And so Mario Draghi, chair of the, or president of the ECB, on July 26, 2012, gave probably the most famous central banker speech of all. And the key phrase I want to emphasize here is in bold. Within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. So how did financial markets react? A big, giant sigh of relief. And so why did this work? And I have a nice graphic here in just a second. So in this particular instance, Mario Draghi and the ECB had cred. The public at large believed that they would follow through if need be. So here's a really good graph here. So on the vertical axis, we have longer term government debt interest rates. And we have them for Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. And you can see the interest rates of Italy and Spain, which were having very, very hard times, relatively elevated compared to the French and German interest rates. And you can see that as soon as Mario Draghi gave his speech, interest rates on Italian and Spanish, and also this graph doesn't have it, but Greek debt fell dramatically. And that really improved the financial conditions in the Eurozone and improved confidence that the Euro would carry on. So now let's turn to the empirical evidence. The first thing we run into is that aside from communication from a central bank, lots and lots of things affect both financial asset market prices and economic variables like investment and consumption and exports and imports. And so it's difficult, in other words, to isolate the impact of communication from a central bank on interest rates or on GDP growth from other factors that will affect interest rates or GDP growth. But even still, economists have tried really hard to do this. And so what we want to do is think about how this might happen. And we want to look at what's called an event study. And so what's an event study? So central banks make announcements about policy all the time. And so these announcements, these are what are referred to as the events. So when a central bank makes a policy announcement, what's the impact on interest rates or stock prices or foreign exchange rates or any other financial market variable you're interested in? And in order to find this announcement effect, economists use what's referred to as high frequency data. In other words, minute by minute by minute price changes. And so why do they use such high frequency data? Why not, in other words, just daily data? Well, if we use just daily data, this is the problem. Over even an ordinary day, lots of new information shows up in financial markets and will affect financial asset prices. And it would be difficult for a, a, a researcher to sort of sort out, well, what's the impact of the central bank's announcement versus the impact of other data that we're showing up? But if you use high frequency data, and there's an announcement at say exactly 2 p.m. by the central bank, it's easier for the researcher to isolate, well, at 2 p.m., nothing else happened except for that central bank's policy announcement, so they can watch what happens to the data. But even still, with event studies, there are some complications. The complication comes up with, well, maybe at 2 p.m., that's when the central bank makes the announcement, but that there might have been rumors in the days and maybe even weeks past about the central bank making that exact announcement. And so these rumors might have affected asset prices in financial markets. And so once the actual announcement is made, nothing happens. There's no reaction because it was already kind of known information. And so what happens is that in event studies, sometimes what they do is they study what are referred to as policy surprises. In other words, unanticipated changes or announcements in policy communications. So what we'll do here is we're going to look at two types of, of Federal Reserve communications. So first, forward guidance with respect to the federal funds rate, and then announcements with respect to large-scale asset programs, in other words, quantitative easing, or QE. So first, let's take a look at the Fed's uh, forward guidance with respect to the federal funds rate. 
So in our previous four guidance video, we discussed the various languages the Fed used to try to communicate how long it would keep the federal funds rate at what's referred to as the zero lower bound. And so in 2011, they announced that they were going to keep it at around zero until at least mid-2013. So the question arises, well, at that announcement, did that change people's expectations of how long the federal funds rate would be around zero? And the answer is yes. And so right here, this is when the Fed announced that they were going to keep the federal funds rate at zero, at least until mid-2013. And the blue chip expectations of, uh, you know, of time until Fed liftoff, that's a survey of economists based on how long they expect to keep the federal funds rate at zero. And so you can see that as soon as that was announced, expectations of liftoff, in other words, when the federal funds rate would be raised, changed dramatically. So communication matters in terms of expectations. But what we really care about here, of course, is, well, did interest rates actually change? Did they actually move in response? And so we have a very helpful uh, study from, uh, from John Williams. And so what he looked at, we're going to isolate three areas here. We're going to look at the Fed's announcement of the 2013 language, the 2014 language, and the 2015 language. And so what he did is he looked at how, on that announcement, interest rates on three-month treasuries, six-month treasuries, one-year, two-year, five-year, and 10-year treasury yields changed. So if you look at the red boxes here, notice that the 10-year treasury yield fell by almost 23 basis points. A basis point is one one-hundredth of a percentage point. So it fell almost a quarter percentage point on the announcement that the Fed was going to keep interest rates low until at least mid-2013. And notice this, this effect was largest for the 10-year and declined for relatively shorter maturities. Fast forward to the 2014 and 2015 language. Notice that on average, the, the impact was much smaller on all ranges of maturities. In fact, you know, roughly zero for, for many of the maturities. And so what might be happening here is maybe that these particular announcements were less surprising than the initial announcement. So now let's take a look at um, information communication related to the various large-scale asset purchase programs. So let's look at QE1. So in 2008, 2009, the Fed made various policy communications about the size of QE, when it would start, how long it would go, and so forth. And so the question is, on these announcements, how did interest rates react? So over on the right here, there are some graphs of on the different days, on five days here, of how the 10-year Treasury rate moved at the announcement time. So the vertical dotted line there is the announcement time where the Fed made a communication relevant to QE1. So let me just look at uh, two of them uh, in particular here. So let's look at the November 25th. This is the first sort of formal kind of official announcement of QE1. And as you can see, at the time it was announced, there wasn't very much of a change in the yield. Well, one possible reason for that is there might have been some expectation there that the Fed was going to do this. And so once they actually announced it, not much of a response. The other one I want to focus on is on March 18th, 2009. This is an announcement where the Fed dramatically increased the scale of QE1. The initial uh, QE1 announcement was for around $600 billion and some change. This was expanded dramatically on March 18th to well over a trillion dollars. And this was unexpected, in, in, uh, almost certainly. And notice here the dramatic decline in the 10-year yield. That to this day, even over 10 years later, is one of the most dramatic one-day declines in the 10-year treasury that's, that's been on record. So, Communication matters in terms of longer-term interest rates, especially. We can do the same thing with QE2. QE2 was uh, announced uh, in 2010, and it was on a much smaller scale. And so the official uh, announcement uh, was actually on uh, September 21st, 2010 here. And notice that um, 
the, uh, the reaction was relatively more mild. And then actually a slight mis, uh, misstatement here, there was, some, there was a preliminary announcement or speculation on September 21st, 2010, and then the actual official announcement, be correct here, was in fact on November 3rd, 2010. And notice, interestingly, interest rates actually rose on the announcement of QE, of QE2. There's a possibility that one reason for this was that QE2 was much smaller than was anticipated. It was only around, only, only around 600 billion, and financial markets were expecting a bit more, and so maybe it was somewhat of a disappointment, so maybe that's why interest rates rose. Well, what about foreign exchange rates? Well, what we can do here is we can take a look at an announcement on December 16th, 2008. Kimmy is also evaluating the potential benefits of purchasing longer-term treasury securities. And so you can see here is that upon that announcement is that the value of the pound, the euro, the Canadian dollar, and the Japanese yen all gained value against the U.S. dollar, or in other words, the U.S. dollar depreciated against these four foreign currencies. And three of them, notice, depreciated by two percentage points or more. And that, by the way, is a very large move in foreign exchange rates. So announcements matter on foreign exchange rates. We can look at a QE3 announcement. QE3, the third round of large-scale asset purchases, without going into the details here, the Fed announced they were going to buy $85 billion per month combined in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. So on the September 13th announcement, again, we've got the same foreign, four foreign currencies, the pound, the euro, the Canadian dollar, and the Japanese yen. You can see the announcement impact was very mild relative to our previous example. And part of that could have been that it was expected, and so it was not a surprise. In other words, it was not new information. We can also look at the impact of announcements on stock prices. So Swanson did a very uh, interesting study. He looked at uh, forward guidance changes compared to announcements of large-scale asset purchases. And so he looked at the period of 2009 through 2015. And I don't have a nice picture, but I have some interesting regression results. And so if we isolate in on these right here, this is a change in forward guidance concerning the federal funds rate. And so the way you interpret that is, is that an increase in the expected Fed funds rate is associated with a lower value of the S&P 500, so note the little negative coefficient here, and it's also correlated with an appreciation of the U.S. dollar against the euro and against the yen. So again, the way the exchange rates are specified, a negative sign indicates an appreciation. So again, higher, for, higher federal funds rate is correlated with an increase in the, or a, a decrease in the S&P 500 and an appreciation of the dollar compared to the euro and the yen. So finally, what we can do here is move on to the economy, because after all, that's what a central bank really cares about. Not so much financial asset market prices, but the overall economy. Well, this is a lot more difficult question to answer. And the whole reason for this is very straightforward. So for example, we've talked about how interest rates might affect consumption and might affect investment. The difficulty here is that consumption and investment are affected obviously by many, many other things aside from monetary policy. And worse, investment and consumption change very slowly over time. And so it's very difficult, for example, to do kind of an event study on consumption or, or uh, GDP growth or investment because these factors don't change immediately, but they change rather relatively slowly. So what economists try to do is they try to build models. And for example, the model we'll look at here, the model includes how a change in forward guidance impacts interest rates. And then elsewhere in the model, interest rates in turn affect output, employment, inflation, and other macro variables. So the idea is to link a change in forward guidance with a change in the macro variables. 
And so what's done is sometimes, and this is some fairly standard verbiage, is to introduce what's called a forward guidance shock. In other words, a change in forward guidance into the model, see what happens to interest rates, and then how interest rates affect output, employment, and other macro variables. And what's important to note here is there's a lot of margin for error. This is not by any stretch an exact science. So the study I'm going to look at here is uh, from Bundick and Smith very recently. They're at the, the Kansas City Fed. So they introduce these forward guidance surprises, and they do two things. They introduce these in two ways. They simulate a model. So they invent a mathematical model of economy, and they use a forward guidance surprise to simulate the impact. And so these are these various dashed red lines right here on output, investment, capacity utilization, and the aggregate price level. And the idea is if there's a positive forward guidance surprise in terms of lowering interest rates, this works to increase output, increase investment, increase capacity utilization, and increase the price level. In other words, to increase aggregate demand. They also, in another experiment, they look at, well, okay, let's try to introduce these forward guidance surprises in a model where actual data are used. That's the solid blue line. And so you can see that, not exactly, but roughly, the, the results are similar, is that when given the actual data, output tends to rise, investment tends to rise, capacity utilization tends to rise, and prices tends to rise. So the whole point is this. Forward guidance can impact investment, can impact output, and can impact overall inflation. So in summary here, there's lots and lots of ways in which central bank communication can impact both the financial markets and the economy. And the overall findings, and this is not universal by any stretch of the imagination, that forward guidance can affect the overall uh, asset market in terms of stock prices, bond prices, and foreign exchange rates, and then in turn, these impacts are transmitted to the overall economy. Thank you very much.